Okay, I'm back. I, I was actually here a minute ago. Uh, you just didn't see me. <laughs> it's one of those, it was uh, one of those metafictional, metafilmic, metacomputational things. Anyway, um, when I was walking this morning, it was so beautiful. Uh, it was the first real May, well, not even May day, but just even a day, a spring day when it actually felt like it wasn't bitter and, you know, jaded, <laughs> jaded spring day. And we should write a book about how there's a, uh, you know, spring is, spring will embody spring as a sort of, <laughs> you know, the chain smoking, you know, down at the heels, like, oh. You know, <laughs> this guy is like, or gal is like, oh, you know, enough already of the buds and everything. Anyway, um, so what I was reminded of, because it was beautiful, it's sort of, it was sunny and it actually was warm and and the magnolia trees are out and not much else is, but the flowering trees are out. It's so weird because the magnolia trees are out and they look amazing and then there's nothing, you know, then, then there's a the magnolia tree and they're flying or there's some kind of other, what looked to me like flower, uh, flowering jasmine. But anyway, I don't know. I don't know these things. I just work here. Anyway, um, it was I was reminded of uh, this wonderful scene in Huck Finn, Huckleberry Finn, which is a great book. I I um, it's I love Twain, and you know I I know that. Uh, Okay, yeah, I, just read the damn book. I, <laughs> read the thing. Um, anyway, there's a wonderful passage where um, Huck and Jim are on the raft, and they're going down the Mississippi. And to freedom. That's the idea. Um, and they've passed by the sort of terrible things that have happened. You know, the, there's been the wreck. If you don't know the book, there's been a wreck. And um, uh, Huck is determined to get on the wreck and find out whether or not his father's on it. And Jim goes instead, and they nearly get separated. It's, it's, a, it's a very traumatic sort of thing. And you have to remember that Huck is supposed to be a boy. He's supposed to be 14 years old. So um, he doesn't sound like any 14-year-old I ever met, but, you know, at the same time, I didn't live in the middle of the 19th century, so <laughs> I think he wasn't. I think he was, you know, Mark Twain, a 50-something-year-old. Uh, yeah, anyway, blah, blah, blah. So, um, so they're on the river, and things are quiet. And it's one of the few times uh, there it's quiet. And this is one of these famous passages in the book um, because it's an idol, um, I-D-Y-L-L, -L, usually, um, which is like, a, hmm, this is a sort of beautiful, lyrical, quiet uh, moment, basically. It's very pastoral. And so Huck... Uh, they're they're just floating down the river and they're okay. You know they they they, they fish and they sleep and uh, the raft is you know they're, they've gotten the raft is beginning to look like a home and so on. He says two or three days and nights went by. I reckon I might say they swum by. They slid along so quiet and smooth and lovely. Here's the way we put in the time. It was a monstrous big river down there, sometimes a mile and a half wide. We run nights and laid up and hid daytimes. As soon as night was most gone, we stopped navigating and tied up because they're, they're, like, this Jim is a slave, right? So he's a fugitive and uh, they can't be seen during the day. Nearly always in the dead water under a towhead. Um, when you have a deadfall, which is at the time was very common because first of all, most of the, most of the banks of the Mississippi were not, um, had not been clear cut and, you know, sort of quote unquote, settled the way they have been now. Well, it's just now it's just, you know, an industry. 
Um, but you would have uh, big trees fall over into the water, and then they would, you know, some they might get pulled along or something like that. They might get stuck, and you'd have this huge root system, um, which would suddenly be in the air and that kind of thing. And it would just, the, the log, basically the now dead tree, would just get stuck there, and um, it would collect things behind it. But that's a towhead. And then young cottonwoods and willows and hid the raft with them. So they, they basically pull up into one of these uh, sort of backwaters. We then set out the lines. So these are fishing lines, right? Next, we slid into the river and had a swim so as to freshen up and cool off. So remember, it's hot. Eh? I mean, this is they're, they're in the south, and so it's the summer. And um, so it's been hot. Then we sat down on a sandy bottom where the water was about knee deep and watched the daylight come. Now, this is just this beautiful moment. Not a sound anywhere, perfectly still, just like the whole world was asleep. Only sometimes the bullfrogs are cluttering, maybe. The first thing to see looking way over the water was a kind of dull line. That was the woods on the other side. You couldn't make nothing else out. Then a pale place in the sky. Then more paleness spreading around. Then the river softened up way off and weren't black anymore, but gray. You could see little dark spots drifting along ever so far away, trading scows and such things. And long black streaks, rafts. Sometimes you could hear a sweep creaking. This would be the the oar at the back of the of the raft, which they used to sort of push it along. Or jumbled up voices. It was so still and sounds come so far. And by and by you could see a streak on the water, which you know by the look of the streak there's a snag swift there, swift in the swift current, which breaks on it and makes that streak look that way. So you get a one of these again one of these you know uh, bad basically a, a deadfall some piece of of timber or lumber that stopped and you can just see the little tiny top of it um, and it just breaks the water and there's a streak that the, that it makes and the water bubbles around it right so he's looking at that um, and you see the mist curl up off the water and the east reddens up and you know by the, the reeds reddens up, and the river, and you make a log cabin in circle. The east reddens up, and the river. Okay, so something wrong with this version of the text. Sorry about that. Uh, the east reddens up, and the river, and you make a log cabin in the edge of the woods, away on the other bank, on the other side of the river, being a wood yard, likely, and piled up by them cheats so you can throw a dog through it anywhere. So, then the night spring springs up and comes fanning you from over there, so cool and fresh and sweet to smell on account of the woods and flowers. But some of them is not that way because they left dead fish laying around, gars and such, and they do get pretty rank. And next you've got the full day and everything's smiling in the sun and the songbirds just going it. And this is one of these just wonderful passages of sort of describing what it is to see uh, not so much creation because we tend to think that light is creation, but to see the change of things, you know, from things going from this uh, the nightscape that they have been living in to the, the, the dayscape, basically. Okay, anyway, that's what I was thinking of this morning when I was out for my walk. And a good walk it was, too. Um, so today, viewings, and I had thought about doing, um, recommending a movie, which I ultimately will recommend, <laughs> so stay tuned, uh, just not today. This this thing hasn't been available on DVD, this thing I'm, I'm going to talk about in a couple of days, hasn't been available on DVD for ever. I mean, they, so I just looked it up and they've actually made it available now. It's wonderful. It's actually on Blu-ray, uh, which is fantastic. And um, so I'm going to talk about that, but not today. Today what I'm going to talk about is Time Bandits. Yay! Time Bandits. Let's hear it for Time Bandits. Yay! This is the Kermit part of the... Yay! This seems to be a special edition. It's quite a nice edition here. Future presentation. And uh, this is bonus materials, uh, yeah, which has the, uh, you can see it, yeah, you can just see the, uh, the, the sort of 
blueprint thingy behind it. That's the map. And it even has a little book insert. Oh my God, this is when <laughs> this is when people thought DVDs were going to last. <laughs> Thanks, he made them for the rest of us who are going to be. Oh, look at this thing of beauty! Wow, it actually opens up, and there's the map. What a blast! You can actually have your very own map. Oh, isn't that great? Wow. A good reason not to. A good reason not to have the Blu-ray. Uh, yeah, and then there's a little discussion and uh, chapters and a picture of uh, David Warner <laughs> playing the bad guy. David Warner had a lot of fun playing bad guys, I think. Um, and this movie is... Uh, my memory is it's the first movie that Terry Gilliam made um, after... Uh, spent, uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Terry Gilliam is the genius, really, behind so much of the Python. Um, well, he did all the animations. He did all the graphics for uh, the show. So if you look back at the show, that's all Terry Gilliam's work. Gilliam was a very interesting guy. He was extremely bright, very talented, still is. Um, crazy. Which is what you need. I mean, just completely possessed of this sort of uh, <laughs> this Looney Tunes, and uh, I will talk about another one of his films. I usually I usually get people to see Brazil, and I'll talk about Brazil on its own. It's just such a it's such a whole another thing. But ter but Time Bandits, I'm I'm giving to you today because it's a Time Bandit sort of day. Um, this is the kind of day where you put Time Bandits on and you're like, way, because it's just such a blast. It's such an adventure, and uh, it's just rolls from one sort of crazy wonderful idea to another and uh yeah that's great and the the actors are all great so it, it still had people from python in it so like john cleese has a little part in it and oh man what else uh he plays robin hood um <laughs> and it's it's sort of the most a typical Python-esque, sarcastic take on Robin Hood as you could possibly imagine, because he's in the process of distributing, redistributing the wealth. He has to beat people. <laughs> oh, it's very well done. But in a typically British sort of way, he's just going you know, to clobber them on the head. And then, you, know, you have to get hit if you're going to, you know, you can't just get your thing. You have to. <laughs> so then I says, can I have that silver cup without being used? He says, no, that's not how it works. Bong. <laughs> Gives him a silver cup. Oh, that's so wonderful. Um, and Michael Palin is in it. Um, I'm trying to remember sort of the other, the other, Eric Idle is in it. Yeah, he plays a sort of character. Um, but they're not really important particularly. What's important is the story about the boy. And this, this is the first movie in the Dreamer, so-called Dreamer trilogy. Um, the Gilliam, who had made, directed Life of Brian... Uh, well, okay, he directed uh, Holy Grail, Life of Brian, and he directed Jabberwocky on his own, which was, it, it didn't work. It um, it was disappointing, um, but he didn't have any money, so I think, so they that didn't really work. But he slowly scraped together enough money in and began to sort of amass enough cultural power, and then he was able to make Brazil, and Brazil is a true work of genius, I. I mean, uh, that is, it's certainly, as far as I'm concerned, the high point of his career so far. I, I hope that he can do something else, but. And then, you know, he went on to make films, which you you probably have seen some of. Um, some maybe not so much. Like, he just made something with Christoph Waltz. Oof, I can't remember what it's called. Um, it was available on Netflix for a while. It's not anymore. Um, he made the Lost in La Mancha, which was, uh, finally, he made the Don Quixote film that he'd been trying to make for 20 years. Oh, God. I think, actually, Lost in La Mancha was the d documentary about the making of it, and it just, uh, the documentary is so depressing, it, it, it's just so painful to watch it. Like, at one point, they're shooting in Spain, I think. Hmm, I'm not even sure it's Spain, it's somewhere else, like... They're shooting, maybe they're shooting in, I don't know, Serbia or 
Bulgaria or something like that, and they also shoot in Spain. And, and at one point, they're set up, and and one of the assistant directors or some, one of the sort of people whose like job it is to do this kind of you know take care of things looks around and he says, "I, Terry, I, I think we better get under. I think there's going to be rain. I you can see rain, and you know." And Gilliam is like, "Well, let's shoot," you know. And, <laughs> And he's like, I don't think we... So then it cuts to the, you know, 20 minutes later, like, you know, the camera goes off. And then you're inside the, one of their cars and there's torrential rain that's coming down. And meanwhile, the, the guy who's making the documentary is filming through the car windows that he's filming. The set is literally floating past. I mean, like, the, the Klieg lights are... <laughs> oh, my God. It's a, we went to watch this thing and, uh, and you see little... Pits of little bits of what parts of what would have been the movie, and which of course never got made. And it like Johnny Depp was supposed to be in it, and uh, a friend, a famous Philip Rush, Rushmore, I think it is. Um, uh, Philip, yeah, Philip Rushmore, I think. Oh, Jean, 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 something Rushmore, Jean Rushmore, uh, some Rushmore, <laughs> one of those, two, one of those crazy Rushmores, um, you know, just down the lane. <laughs> You know they're right. They're right across in the do do can tells. Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, Jean Rochefort, and um, you know he has to go home because he hasn't talked about this. But uh, it turns out that he's got some kind of cancer, and uh, which they operate on, and they save his life. But but meanwhile, he's been riding a horse, and it's been uh, you know it's some kind of answer down of the in the groin or something like that i don't know that's oh god you know so he, he has to leave and he won't say anything about it because he doesn't want to lose the job and blah, blah, blah. anyway so the the documentary is just such a oh it's just so awful anyway it's just like watching this happen but gilliam is i mean there is a testament to this sort of the incredible endurance of this guy as a sort of as a as an auteur you know as a as a as a visionary and um, I'll, as I say, I'll talk about that again when we come to Brazil more in the story about Poo Poo Pictures, which is always charming. Um, he made uh, 12 Monkeys, which you may have seen because it has Brad Pitt in it, um, where Brad Pitt actually plays um, schizophrenic, uh, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bruce Willis. It was one of those interesting things about Bruce Willis, who's been prepared to take chances. You know, worked with uh, M. Night Shyamalan back in the day, and, and uh, yeah, uh, Willis is an interesting character in, in that in that way. Anyway, this movie is sort of before all that happens, but it's the it's a, the beginning of the critical mass that that Gilliam is going to need to start making films that have are able to have the scope of his incredible imagination. So. The Dreamer trilogy is Time Bandits, so this, this one, Time Bandits, and then Brazil. So this is the Dreamer as young boy, and then there's Brazil, which is the Dreamer as young man, and then there's the Dreamer as old man, and that's the Adventures of Baron Munchausen. And these three films are considered to be um, the discussion, basically, of what what it is to be a Dreamer, you know, what it is to be essentially, in many ways, cursed. Uh, and they're obviously about the creative process and uh, and so on. Um, you may have more recently seen the the film that he tried to make with Heath Ledger um, before Heath Ledger obviously killed himself and he wasn't dragging his corpse around, called The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, which has Tom Waits in it. It's so great to see Tom Waits. He plays the devil. And um, and again, it's got these three, the three sort of young young men I'm trying to remember who the three the three boys are. Uh, Johnny Depp, um, Heath Ledger. Is another one. It's like not Josh Hartnett, but sort of one of those. Uh, you know, they sort of all look. Oh, pardon me. They all look alike. I mean, they're all you know young. I guess beautiful young men. Anyway, uh, so you may know Terry Gilliam, but not really know you know him. That's the point. But this, so they say at the top here that this has John Cleese, uh, Sean Connery, and Shelley Duvall. Sean Connery has a very small role. He plays, although actually he's, he's really good, he plays Theseus, uh, which is great. It's an amazing role. Uh, but it's a little tiny cameo. 
and Shelley Duvall has a little tiny cameo as well. I mean, you don't you don't see this movie for those people. You see this movie because it's about a boy who was born into this um, sort of quintessential small British suburban stifling, you know, horrible sort of uh, soul killing uh, existence and which he escapes because he falls into the dream reality of uh, some gardeners. And the gardeners are all little people, and uh, many of whom became famous because they worked for uh, George Lucas, like Kenny Baker is in it. My memory is Kenny Baker's in it. And Kenny Baker was uh, R2-D2, right? It was inside R2-D2, poor guy. Uh, as a living, I guess. <laughs> well, it's a living. <laughs> He's just, oh, jeez. Um, and they're gardeners, and um, they're gardeners for God. <laughs> and so they steal the map, which is basically the map of creation, <laughs> and God starts to chase them. <laughs> this is a crazy idea. And they start running, you know, and some, so the boy gets caught up in this he's he's uh, is one of the walls of his house of his room becomes because he's a dreamer so there's an entry point into his world basically it's very similar to the phantom tollbooth which i talked about uh some days ago now um and i'm just trying to remember what his name is oh yeah napoleon yeah, ian holm plays napoleon um but it was the boy, for Christ's sakes. I mean, even talk about him. He's the most important person. Kevin, right? Kevin, yeah. And um, <laughs> so the supreme being, not God, but the supreme being. The supreme being is played by Ralph Richardson, who is who is wonderful, you know. And he uh, he he mostly appears as sort of the kind of Wizard of Oz. Uh, the he is yeah. He sort of appears as this kind of head, you know. Take return the map. To bring back what you have stolen <laughs> and they're always running uh. so there are all these you know little people running uh, and they're busy running away from and they run from time hole to time hole so they travel all over time right so this is the this is the narrative which holds the thing together and so they 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 drop into a time hole and they land and the map which is what i showed you has is a map to all the time holes and so they can navigate around the universe <laughs> and one of them uh randall knows how to read the map and because uh, he's smart and, and the rest of them go along and they're very sort of they're very amiable sort of dopey uh you know there's workers they work on small things like they <laughs> they work on shrubs mostly <laughs> and you know they don't they don't get to do trees because <laughs> they're small they get to do shrubs you know? oh, you're hoping to work on greenery <laughs> Oh, it's very charming. It's just such a great idea. Everything about it is completely it's just genius. It's just it's just so fresh and new and it was it was nineteen eighty two. It's still fresh and new. Is it eighty two or nineteen eighty? Anyway, it was around there. And nothing, nothing looks like and still nothing looks like this. I mean, even now because it was all done physically, right? It was done with physically and with animation. It wasn't done with any there were no computers that could do this kind of rendering at the time. So even now, with all the tools that you would think that people would, you know, but people don't have the imagination, which really goes to, uh, it goes to show you <laughs> that the person is much more important than the tools are. And all with the tools, you know, uh, if you've got, you know, they, it's, there's that, it says uh, broken crayons color too. It's like, yeah, broken crayons color too. In fact, maybe you get better colors of the broken crayons. Sheesh. So... Now that doesn't stop me from buying art supplies. I just want to say, <laughs> I just want to, you know, confess that <laughs> there isn't an art supply I don't like the look of. I love it. Well, actually, the art supplies I'm not fond of, particularly are the digital ones. It's like, who cares? Blech. Just another piece of, you know, plastic to write on a piece of glass with some software. Blech. Who wants that? Ugh. You know, I don't want that. Screw it. But, you know, if, it's, if it can make a mark on a piece of paper, on a beautiful piece of paper, Oh, yeah, I want that. And it's a, it's a brush I wanted. You know, it's a, some kind of paint. I want that, too. <laughs> uh, I've never seen a surface I wouldn't paint on. Quite happily. Anyway, um, so Kevin throws in his lot with the, with the men. And off they go on their adventure. And they land the first, oh, the first, they land in this ogre's 
uh, they land in, the, in water, basically, and they're near an ogre's um, sort of boat, and uh, this is kind of ship of some kind. It's sort of a small sailing ship, and um, the ogre is played by Michael Palin, if my memory serves. Um, yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> and uh, he catches all the little men in his net. And he brings them up, you know, and, and he says, "Oh, you know." I, uh, mother, I've caught dinner, you know, and he's going to eat them. And she's like, oh, God, you know, it's one of the typical sort of Monty Python people who always plays one of the women. And he's like, oh, God, dear, that's wonderful. You know, and she's busy killing something in the kitchen, in the galley. And uh, they, because Kevin is with them, basically, they he is smart. And so he gets, he gets them out of things. And uh, so Kevin figures out the map. Like, they've stolen the map, but they don't know what to do with it. And they're being chased by the supreme being. So they go down a time hole and disappear. So they're okay for the moment. So they land in this in the water. <clears throat> the, yoga, the ogre pulls them up into the boat. And um, so one of, and he's gnashing his teeth and he's like, you know, ah, now I, uh, and he has this back spasm. <laughs> oh, no. And at the time when this film came out, I had just begun having what would prove to be a lifelong uh, a life of difficulty, basically, with a very, quite a yeah, severe <laughs> sort of back problem. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I remember watching, going, "Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah," and he's like, "Oh," because he's in the middle of his, he's like in the middle of like, ha ha, this demonic laugh, ha ha. He's like, "Oh," <laughs> and can't laugh, and he's like, "Oh." So Kevin says, "Oh, do you have a bad back?" And and he's like. Oh. Yes, I do. And he's like, oh, I know a cure for that. And then so he gets all the little men. So he gets them to free him from the net. And they all get out. And they start to stretch him. And he's like, oh, I feel really... So he's lying there and he's being stretched by all these little men. Each one of them takes like a, a hand. And he's like, oh, I, I feel really good. He says, yes, yes. You know, and he says, this will, this will really help you. Know, so they're, they're pulling him. And then they're like... And they start to throw him. And they throw him overboard, right? And he's like, but he's happy. He doesn't care. I mean, he's an ogre, you know. And he says, this is wonderful. At last, I can really cough. <laughs> and this is really true. It's like when you've got a bad back and your back is used to going into spasm, if you're used to the muscles are so tight that you, they're protecting, they're guarding around the joint that's a flake, that's a flame, inflamed, basically. So the muscles get very tight. And uh, then when you do something to irritate the muscles, they start spasming. And the spasms can be very painful. You think you're going to die. And you're not going to die. It's just a back spasm. But it feels like the end of the world. And especially because you don't know anything about your back at that point. You think, oh, this is it. I'm done for. And the pain is so bad. That's the point, right, about pain. is to make you stop doing what you were doing. And it works. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it also makes you stop doing everything else, too. <laughs> uh, pain. Oh, yeah, sweet. Anyway. Yeah, our little uh, built-in uh, warning system. Not so little. It's just through and through the body, like everywhere you touch. Pain. Oh no, don't do that. Anyway, so uh, and so they uh, get back in the boat, and um, the boat starts to rise out of the water. And you're like, what is going on? And there's this sort of dome, and it turns out that the boat is the ha a giant's hat, and this giant comes standing out of the water and all of this is actually done for real like Gilliam used all the skills he learned to use doing Python he knew how to do things on the cheap he was bright and so this giant gets out and he's got this boat hat and so they see they're like oh and so Kevin says we have to knock him out. And so they put the sleeping potion into a bellows, you know, and they open one of the hatches and they stick it down and, uh, you know, and uh, they conk the giant out and he's like, oh, and he sits down you know, and he takes his hat off and everything is super slow and the boat tilts over and they all fall over the boat on to the next adventure. Right? So they visit Robin and Sherwood Forest and they go to the Kevin sees meets Theseus who's going to deal with a minotaur and he really is happy to stay with Theseus that's the thing because Theseus is played by Sean Connery so he he's recognizes here's a hero and here's a father figure you know here's a he's a true a true father who he can be with but the men come and get him because they know Kevin knows how to read the map Kevin has figured it out because he's bright and so they need him 
So they come and take him away, and finally that that makes him angry, and he's he he's it makes him unhappy, and that, I guess he's angry, yeah. So it's it's very um, it's kind of like a, a an iteration of of a form of a version of where the wild things are in some ways because it is a child's uh, dream, and a child's dream, like any dream is full of violence and fear, wonder and amazement, um, and a lot of terror. You know, I mean, we, we, I think every parent knows that the children are scared a lot, um, but they're busy telling them, no, there's nothing to be afraid of. It's like, yeah, there is stuff to be afraid of. I mean, obviously you can't say that to a kid because it'll flip him or her out, but her or him or they, you know, the child will be afraid. And um, these fears are incredibly intense. The visions are incredibly intense. The amazement is incredibly intense. And Gilliam's point is that basically, obviously, you know, this is a typical old point, is that you forget, we forget, you know, how to dream. And you can't, you know, if you're gonna, if you forget how to dream, well, you know, basically then you're gonna wind up living in one of these uh, exurban, um, sort of these terrible, you know, claustrophobic suburbs that people live in um, without any sort of imagination. There's nothing, you know, nothing going on in your head. So uh, they travel all over the place, and <laughs> they they uh, at one point uh, they they land in a huge ship, and they get outfitted. They're all wearing white tuxes. They're wearing white evening suits, and they look amazing. They all got big cigars, and they're all so happy, and they're drinking. Champagne and you know, it's like oh it's wonderful these things are great it's fin and, and one of the Randall says uh, he's sort of the leader says oh you know finally things are going our way and it's like well I I'll, I'll leave that for you to see what happens next and they want to because they're sort of these um, you know they're they're thieves and they're also uh, they're used to working for a living so they're like screw this you know it's a terrible way to live like screw that they want to you know they want to live on easy, easy street they want to yeah wear you know white tux and smoke a cigar and drink champagne and you know have a life of ease they don't want to do uh, the supreme beings bidding and make shrubbery this for that so um they <laughs> they want to get to the fortress of ultimate darkness ironically they're chasing as fast as they can to get to evil <laughs> and the evil being is uh, played by david warner and uh, he has his own <laughs> his michael powell ended up playing one of the <laughs> I think plays one of the uh, one of the devils, and he says, uh, "There, he says, uh, okay." Uh, at some point, he's, he's designed something, you know, that's going to be painful, and it's it's like call waiting or something like that. He's like, "Oh yes, you know, the true adventure of the devil." <laughs> <laughs> and he says, uh, "Tell me about fast breeder reactors." So this is great because uh, in the eighties. Nuclear power was considered to be, uh, still considered to be, sort of the answer going forward, as they as we say now, um, but the answer for future oil oil problems, especially after the oil crisis in uh, late seventies in seventy seven, and uh, so the problem was that people were, apart from the fact that any any reactor really has a life of, it should only have a life of about thirty years, and then the whole thing is so hot they have to shut it down. And that's it. You got to leave it for another 200,000 years until it cools off um, and you got to like you, you can't go in and that's it you know you got to shut it down you can't run it and it's, everything gets attacked by the radiation the metal starts to break down and all that you know the, the water's hot da, da, da. so breeder reactors are they are even worse I mean you're using you use uh, it's like the they they have an even shorter lifespan it's, they're even dirtier they're even hotter and so on. So fast breeder reactors, you know, it was, a, it was a creation of the devil. So uh, that kind of thing. So it's it's very good. And uh, the whole of the sort of the the uh, underworld is all uh, mechanistic. It's all mechanical. You know, so it's all sort of you know, tubes and things and coils. And and you will see that again in Brazil, um, where the dreamer will always come up against the machine of one kind or another. Um, in various different guises. Um, in this case, uh, the machine is sort of the, the sort of. I think Gilliam just he was he was getting it. He was just getting as he was getting a grip on it. By the time he got to Brazil, he really 
what he had it in his head. I was like, yeah, this is the, it was such a piece of genius. Baron Munchausen, um, while delightful, is, um, doesn't have the, the heft for me, I think. Um, but anyway, there are some wonderful, <laughs> there are some amazing moments. There's a, <laughs> there's a moment where uh, Vulcan, which is the Roman god, right, of uh, the forge, uh, which was in Greece was Hephaestus, uh, in the Greek pantheon was Hephaestus, uh, who was the smith who forges um, Achilles' shield, is my memory of it. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. Ooh, I can't remember. Um, and the shield, I think it's Achilles' shield, and the shield has this it's a work of, I mean, based the shield written the shield uh, has the story of creation on it it's just i mean homer spends i don't remember you know two thousand lines i think talking about the shield it's an amazing piece of poetry uh anyway so Hephaestus, so vulcan and uh uma thurman who was like you know 22 at the time plays his uh his muse and uh She's bored with him. Like she's a flirt, <laughs> and she's like, "Oh," so he says, "Oh my dear," you know, and he's all sort of singed because he's used to being in the forge, <laughs> right? So he's uh, it's Oliver Reed plays him, and uh, Oliver Reed was such a stocky. Brr. He you see him in Gladiator. Uh, he that was his last role before he died. He plays the guy who uh, organizes Russell Crowe's. Uh, he's the impresario, basically, who makes Russell Crowe's. Uh, career uh, in the ring um but so he's a you know, look sort of saturnine you know anyway so he's perfect for this and he's oh my dear you know and he's got sort of these burn patches of his beard and his hair is sort of you know, <laughs> it's wild and he's he's all scruffy and cold he's you know marked by cold because of course they're fueling the, <laughs> the fires of of hades are <laughs> being fueled with coal and uh and he says, uh, oh, for you. And he picks up a piece of coal and he goes, you know, and, he, and he makes a diamond out of it right there. This is charming. And he hands it to her. She says, oh, you know, a diamond. She's, she's got this huge pool of diamonds. Like the last thing she needs is another diamond. She wants to be romanced. You know, then here comes Munchausen, of course, and starts to romance her. That makes Vulcan mad. <laughs> But he's in the middle of a labor dispute <laughs> with his workers. They don't want to stoke the furnaces. And he says, I'm just having a bit of a labor dispute. <laughs> he's trying to get them back to work. Oh, the genius of it. It's just so, oh, it's amazing. So there are these incredible, <laughs> there are these incredible scenes in Baron Munchausen as well. There are really incredible scenes in all of his films. Um, so the chase is on, basically, to the, and the little men want to get to, the little people want to get to the Fortress of Ultimate Darkness. And Kevin keeps telling them that's not a good idea, but they don't care. They they're they just they're in it for the greed. And so they finally get there. <clears throat> and when they get there, of course, it turns out that you know they were they were misled. And the Forge of Ultimate Darkness is done beautifully, and they have to get out. And and uh, it's uh, and it's left with this. <laughs> there this, there's this remarkable. It's like in in one moment, you know. Gilliam just gets what it is that humans do. You know, we're just we're just so incredibly stupid sometimes. It, it's just it's remarkable how dumb we can be. So at one point, uh, so the supreme being comes down and he explains what's being uh, and uh, he's restoring the world basically to its its, its rightful place and so on. And uh, at what point he there's a piece of uh, evil um which sort of looks like smoking sort of debris coal of some kind and he says to the supreme being says to the two parents who are completely gormless they have no idea what's going on don't touch that that's concentrated evil and the first thing you do is touch it they're like <laughs> they turn into two little piles of ash oh it's just so perfect it's like you know the, as soon as you tell somebody don't the first thing they're going to do it's like these people who are, you know, take get tasers and they, they touch them. They just, don't just touch them to their to their bodies. They touch them to their tongues. It's like, yeah, go for it, <laughs> you know, to inject bleach. Anyway, so the film is a wonderful, amazing, visionary. Uh, I mean, it's, it's incredible. There are these incredible scenes where um, they go from 
uh, you know, from dark towers to, you know, wooded glens and, uh, and it's funny and, uh, and charming and it's a chase movie. And, and Kevin is, is, uh, is a good kid. He's not uh, like, you actually like the, you like the kid. He's not, a you know, some squalling, you know, spoiled brat or something like that. British children and uh, European children, child actors, seem to be better able to remain believable as in, as actors or as as beings, I guess, as characters, uh, over Americans who seem to become these sort of crazed little beings. I'm I'm really, but I think that's. Okay, this is a long discussion, which I'll, I'll leave for another time. But I, I think that really has to do with um, the understanding of <clears throat> fame in America and what America can bring. And Nathaniel West was, was on to this in Day of the Locust, where the sort of, in many ways, the most dangerous, sadistic uh, individual is a, like a nine or I think he's a nine-year-old boy. Who's named appropriately enough named Adore? Oh God, he's a terrifying kid who was a, supposed to be a child actor. And um, my memory is that he actually kills uh, Luther. I can't remember the name of the um, one of the characters that uh, the woman takes in. I can't remember. Anyway, uh, it doesn't go well for him. So yeah, child actors. But this is a good child actor. And uh, so what's, as I say, what's important is they sold it to us when we were, when it came out, it was sold to us as the next Monty Python movie, same director as so many of the Python films and other uh, television things. Um, uh, also wrote, occasionally Gar Gilliam appears. Uh, he appears, uh, well, he appears as one of the uh, coconut, <laughs> coconut mocking horses in uh, Holy Grail. Um, but uh, really he was a director and an animator. And the, you can see this sort of wonderful sense of, of vista and vision, uh, just remarkable. So, uh, you know, a good time will be had by all, and it's, um, you just won't know what's coming next, and it's the, it's the best thing in the world.